Hey guys, Keith from Kegland, and today we're doing a 15 minute boil recipe. These are some new recipes which are kind of like partial uh, recipes. So that's where we're using some extract, we've got some beer in hand, so dried malt extract, and we're also gonna use a small amount of grains. Now, we haven't done a lot of these videos up until now, and we wanted to sort of get back into doing some really back to basics kind of videos, I suppose, for home brewers uh, who are getting into the hobby, because I know some of our other videos which cover all grain stuff, it's a bit complicated to jump into right off the bat. So this type of video is sort of really low tech. We're just gonna use this pot here, and we're gonna make this Pacific Ale recipe. If I go back into history of my sort of brewing career, I suppose, this is more or less one of the first steps I made into it, getting off, you know, complete extract can kits. And when I got into it about 20 years ago, um, this is where I really sort of felt there was a really good payoff, I guess you might say. So, I mean, right at the lower end, you've got a, a can kit, a can, a kitten, you know, the kitten kilo, you got, might, might, might want to call it, where you've just got a can, you pour it in, and then you whack in some dextrose and put yeast on top, and that's it. And although that's really simple, you can really get a lot of the benefits of all grain brewing um, by doing some partials. So that's where you've got a little bit of grain mixed with a little bit of extract. And in my opinion, it's kind of like getting 80% of the quality of beer you're gonna get in an all grain recipe, but with a much less equipment and much less time commitment. And you can generally get away with just on the stove top at home without you know anything special. So you hardly have to spend any money to get into this type of kit as well. So I think it's a great place for people to start. And it's a significant jump up in quality from just getting a can of goo in a, and just pouring it in or a sachet of goo and pouring it in. So they do involve the fresh hops. So um, all of the 15 minute boil recipes that we're putting up on the website now, they've got fresh hops, adding fresh hops rather than you know, pre-bitted hops, which are generally in those cans, does really make a difference. And also, when you're steeping a small amount of grains, it really lifts the flavor. Um, because, you know, extract does have a certain flavor to it, certain twang, I guess you might say. But this is a great way to kind of use some grains to kind of cover that up and still make a really fantastic tasting beer. So let's get into it. First thing you need is a pot. Look, I got this one from Ikea. It was pretty cheap. Like at the time of this video, it was $45. And I got this pot, which is a 15 litre pot, because what I want to do is have enough headspace that I comfortably can bring this up to a boil later and still have a little bit of headspace. If you've got a smaller pot, like, you know, maybe an eight or 10 litre pot, that would be fine too. But the smaller pot you go, you can run into some complications if you're boiling because you're gonna have easy boil overs. The other thing is, after I finish boiling, it's kind of nice to have a slightly bigger pot because I can add cold water to it and cool it down without having to transfer it to another vessel. And if you can cool it down a little bit quickly at the end, it is you know slightly preferable. So I can add cold water straight into the pots. So that's why I've chosen this particular pot size. Anyway, getting started with this recipe, what you wanna do is get this water up to um, 70 degrees, between 50 and 70 degrees Celsius, because we're not actually mashing. Most of our sugars uh, that are, and fermentables are coming from these packs of sugar, or the essentially the dextrose, maltodextrin, and the um, dry malt extract uh, sort of bags we've got here. So really, we're just getting these grains and adding them to this recipe to give us that flavor profile that we want, because if you just go pure extract, it's just, as I said, not really fantastic. So this is sitting at something like about, um, you know, 65 degrees, kind of perfect, right in the middle of that hitting range. Um, you definitely will need a thermometer. It doesn't come with a kit, so you can buy that separately. We have some really good instant read thermometers. Also kind of handy is this uh, brewing spoon if you want to buy one of those. Um, also the thermometers, I should say, they're kind of handy if you want to hang it over the side of the pot. If you've got a smaller pot, you can hang it over and take a temperature reading like that or because this hole, the brewing spoon actually fits through here, so you're not just dropping it in there, you can actually just leave it on the pot like that, and then you know it's just hanging into the pot, so it's uh, getting, uh, you can sort of keep an eye on it as you're getting up to that sort of 50 to 70 degree Celsius range. Anyway, uh, let's get into this. I've got to open this bag of malts. Now, various different kits will have various different steeping grains. Um, you know, for this type of Pacific Ale, uh, we don't want, we want it to ferment out pretty dry, so we're gonna stay away from things like crystals and stuff like that. This one, uh, I think we've got some wheat and some other stuff. Yeah, so wheat malt and, and Vienna in there. So look, very subtle kind of flavors. They are probably gonna add a little bit of uh, protein, uh, you know, into this. It gives us a bit more head retention and, you know, gonna fill out that mouth feel. So I'm gonna pour that into this hop sock. The hop sock doesn't come included with these 15 minute boil kits. And 
What I need to do is just leave that in there um, for at least 30 minutes. You can leave it longer if you want. Honestly, you can just leave it in there all day and then come back later. It's not, this the time at which you're leaving this in there to steep, it's not really that, you know, important. It doesn't have to be, you know, bang on, you know, uh, 30 minutes. It's what our instructions say here, but as long as it's at least 30 minutes, that's all you need to know. So I'm just gonna leave that in there. I'm gonna come back uh, a little bit later and I'm gonna pull that out, we'll get to the next step. Alrighty, so I'm back in front of this pot here. It's been half an hour, a little bit over half an hour actually. Temperature's decreased to uh, just under 50 degrees Celsius there, so I'm looking pretty good. And look, smells fantastic. It's smelling like beer should. It's not gonna have heaps of flavor. Always feel free to taste at this stage. You don't have to worry too much about sanitation because we're gonna boil this. But it does have like a very light flavor to it. We've definitely got some good flavor out of the grains there. Um, now what I'm gonna do is just try to drain these out. Now if you get one of our rubber gloves or something like that, we do have some like uh, thick chemically resistant rubber gloves on the website if you wanna buy those. But this is a low tech video, trying to use as little equipment as possible. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna try to get the spoon here. And you should, certainly can squeeze this uh, to try to get more out of it. But look, if you've got the luxury of time, I'm just gonna try to hang this above the, here like that with the spoon. Just gonna let a little bit more drain out of there while I open these packs of sugars, because these are going in next, right? So um, I've got this beer enhancer. Beer enhancer, if you don't know what it is, it basically, it's a mixture of uh, maltodextrin and dextrose. So um, I'm gonna pour that in there, and then I'm gonna pour these other bags in there. And we're also gonna bring this up to the boil. So I might as well hit the, uh, Look, to be honest with you, this induction cooktop has got a really powerful fan, so when I turn it on, it actually is really noisy. So, look, I'll just keep talking and pour this in, and then what I'll do is once I'm finished, I'll hit that on button, otherwise you'll hear this super noisy fan. And then we've got malt extract. Uh, so malt extract comes in a lot of different forms. Um, basically, you've got light and dark, and uh, you've got dry malt extract, and uh, also liquid. In terms of liquid and dry are the two main categories you might want to think about, but. Uh, to be honest, they don't really make much difference whether you're using liquid or dry. Obviously dry just uh, saves us a little bit of postage if we're posting this out to you. So obviously there's not much point to ship liquid to your house. So um, yeah, I'm just pouring that in there. Uh, what you can also do is that bag that we send to you with all the grains, you can use it as a garbage bag. So put that in there. And yeah, these are kind of sugary and get really sticky. So I'm just gonna whack them straight in there like that and get the second bag. So, cause I've got about, um, you know, two kilos of dry malt extract and then also a bag of that uh, beer enhancer. Um, that's gonna get me up to, with a 20 liter batch, which I'm kind of aiming to make, it's gonna get me up to about five and a half percent alcohol, something in that kind of range. But always be aware that you can change this recipe a bit. You can get some extra dextrose or even cane sugar and add it to this, and that's gonna boost the alcohol content. But just be wary that if you go too strong, you know, it's gonna lead to other complications because like, if you go really strong wort, that requires more sugar, um, and it requires maybe even the use of, for instance, oxygen if you go really strong. So just be careful. I'd probably say for you beginners, if you're really getting into it, Probably stick to the recipe the first time. So it's kind of drained off. As you can see, that's not really dripping anymore. So I'm basically gonna heat this up. I'll put that in there like that. Ooh. Take that spoon out of there. Yeah, so really doesn't matter if you're, uh, you know, if you're tasting at this stage. I really encourage all of you guys throughout the entire process, you taste it. Learn what wort should taste like. You know, essentially it's sweet. Doesn't taste bitter at all because we haven't boiled any hops yet. Um, but um, yeah, it's certainly tasting a lot sweeter than before. It's gonna have a few lumpy bits in on the top, but that's really not a big deal. You know, you've got plenty of time for those lumps to come out. Even if some of those lumps go into the fermenter, not a big deal. The yeast will end up eating them up in the fermenter, it'll end up dissolving, because both, um, you know, the beer enhancer and uh, dry malt extract are highly soluble in water, so it's just gonna happen uh, on its own. So don't go crazy feeling you have to squash all the lumps out at this stage. All right, so I'm gonna fire this up, and then once I get up to a boiling point, I'm gonna come back, and then I'm gonna start chucking these hops in there. 
Alrighty, so I've got up to a boil. Um, it's kind of a vigorous boil. I'm not quite on 100% power, so I've just turned it down slightly. Uh, what I've also done is gone away and I've washed that hot bag. So this hot bag basically was full of grains before. I've emptied them out. I've washed out the hot bag, and now I've poured these hops in there. So all of these kits will come with a range of different hops. Some of them are for dry hopping, some are for, for boiling. So when I say dry hops, that's to add later in the fermenter. So you'll have to look at your recipe sheet and see what it says. This one said I've got tahiki, I've got to add 50 grams. Each one of these are 25 grams each. So I've added both of those into this bag here. So I might just explain the chemistry of what's going on here. Essentially, you know, with these hops, there's hop oils in here which we're trying to extract. And if you look at the AA concentration here, that stands for alpha acid, these particular ones have got 6.2, so not particularly high. Uh, but essentially what happens is with those alpha acids which are in the hops, the more I boil those, the more bitter the beer will become. So this is a step that, you know, if we say 15 minutes uh, on the recipe, which is why we call them 15 minute boils, um, please try to keep in that time frame. If you boil them for longer, it's just gonna get more and more bitter because essentially those alpha acids which are in there, the bittering component, the more you boil them, the more that it's gonna get bitter and bitter. So after about an hour, you're gonna basically cap out. That's gonna be like as much bitterness as you can get out of those hops. But as soon as those hops essentially are getting above 80 degrees Celsius, that window of time it's above 80 degrees is gonna mean that isomerization or that bittering reaction is gonna happen. So this is the only part of the process which you really have to be quite specific on how much time you get it. So, you know, I've essentially got that, uh, that stopwatch running and I actually put the timer on this bad boy going as well. So I've got about seven minutes left and it's boiling away nicely. It's also a good idea to keep an eye on it at this, at this stage, because when you're at this boiling temperature, you'll get a few funny things happening and sometimes it can just start vigorously boiling up. And this is the other reason why I've chosen the biggest pot that I could find in the pantry is because I've got a little bit more headroom and the more headroom you have, the more comfortable your boil is gonna be. So when it starts boiling or bubbling up, um, if you've got a little bit of headspace, then obviously that's going to give me a little bit more of a safety factor from having a boil over. You know, scientifically, I can't remember if it's like the coagulation of proteins which causes a boil over, but uh, the most scientific I'm gonna make it in this video is as soon as you turn your back, scientifically, it's proven that it'll boil over at that stage. Another thing you can do is also just get a bottle of water. So if you start seeing it boil up, and let's say using like a really small pot, this is a really good idea. And as soon as it looks like it's gonna boil over, hit it with a bit of water, spray it in there, and that'll basically suppress that boil over going back down again. Look, another thing you can do is we've got firm cap on the website, so that's a little dropper. Add a few drops of that, and it also prevents boil overs. But as I said before, I'm trying to make this as low tech and as simple as possible, showing you that you can do this without any firm cap or without any sort of whiz bang tricks, just uh, you know stuff that you've got lying around the house. Anyway, I'm gonna leave that going for another seven minutes and then we'll come back and then cool it down and get it into fermenter in a moment. All right, so that is the end of the 15 minute boil. Now the race is on to try and cool this down as quickly as possible. Once again, this is one of the reasons of having a big pot is I can just chuck water on top. Now the other thing I should say is, last one minute of the boil, I also put this lid on because I want to kind of heat the lid up and start sanitizing the lid as well. I'm gonna need this lid later on when I'm cooling down. I kind of want this lid to be as clean as possible. You could also get the Stella Sand sanitizer to sanitize the lid too. But uh, if you just use heat, that'll work fine. So what I'm gonna do is pull this hops out, this hop sock out first. Now, you certainly could reuse this bag, but look, I'm just gonna turf it, I guess. Yeah, I suppose we've got a lot of them here, and uh, at work, I don't have the ability to easily just put this through our uh, washing machine. So I'm just gonna wait for that to drain out. <clears throat> All right, so the clock is ticking, so I do wanna keep moving and kinda do this as quickly as possible. Um, I'm gonna, got a little bit of work there. Look, if I did have those um, chemically resistant sort of thick gloves, I'd probably give that a bit of a squeeze and you know, it might get like another half a glass of uh, beer out of that uh, hop sock. But look, for the sake of it, I'm not losing that much. I'm just gonna chuck that away. Um, okay, so I've got some cold water here just in this Oxybar eight liter keg. Obviously, you just pour it straight from the tap probably at home, but I don't have a tap in this room. So I'm gonna pour this in here and essentially I'm gonna pour as much in here um, as I possibly can fit in the pot, keeping in mind that I've got to pour out of the pot later as well. So I don't want to like overfill the pot and then make it really, really hard to pour from the pot to the fermenter. 
Um, I'm also trying to, you know, really keep my head from, you know, I've got hairs on my head maybe falling off in there or, you know, even, you know, my breath. You don't really want to be, you know, breathing and spluttering all over the top of this because now that we're sort of getting down in temperature, um, I really want to make sure that I'm trying to keep everything from this point forward as sanitary as possible. Look, some people even used boiled water. If you've got a questionable water supply, you may want to consider using bottled water or something like that. Look, in Melbourne, we've got pretty good water supply. The microbial count in the water is low, quite low. Um, and reality is, as long as I cool it pretty quickly, then you know it will basically not be um, uh, not be not be not be too much at risk. Um, so look, I can kind of put my hands on that. I'm gonna guess that's around about sort of. I reckon that's about 60 degrees because that's just slightly too hot for me to touch. So I'm underneath. Once you're underneath that 80 degrees Celsius point, to be honest, a lot of the pressure is off because I, once you're under 80 degrees, it's not going to isomerize the hops and make it more and more bitter anymore. Or It'll happen at a very slow rate, I should say. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is get this uh, temperature probe. I'm just gonna take a temperature reading. So I'm just gonna get this, uh, I've got some of this ethanol spray over here. So I'm gonna spray that probe down like this. Give it a bit of a shake. And then I'm gonna put that in here like so. And see if I can get an instant temp reading. Yeah, so looks like we're at about just under 60 degrees 57 degrees it looks like so yeah that is obviously still too hot to go in the fermenter but it's underneath that sort of danger zone where i'm isomerizing really quickly so look if you're in a hurry what you can do is get this whole pot whack it in your sink and then just put a water bath around it to cool it down a little bit faster Look, I'm a bit lazy, so I'm just gonna come back uh, a little bit later. Now, if you're using a PET fermenter, so one like this, I'm gonna put it in a PET flat bottom today. So what I've got is some sanitizer. I've already put the Stella Sand sanitizer in here. If you read the instructions of these PET fermenters or any PET fermenter, it'll tell you to not go in here too hot. We recommend that you get the wort down to below 45 degrees Celsius before you put it in the fermenter. The reason why is the plastic will melt if it's over that. So you know, you really do want to get the temperature down before you put it in here. And you kind of have to get it down anyway, because if it's too hot, you're going to chuck the yeast in and then kill the yeast as well. So, you know, I want to be able to pitch this in there. Anyway, so I'm going to come back in a few moments. We'll get it in the fermenter and uh, then get the whole process underway and get those yeast cells going. Now, because this is like a low tech video for entry level guys, we're using our flat bottom fermenter. This is not pressurizable, but it's one of the easiest fermenters to use because it doesn't require any gas cylinder or pressure or anything like that. It's basically got a tap in the side and that makes it really handy for going from the fermenter into bottles and cans and stuff like that. Now, there's a bit of a flip side. As soon as you have a tap in a fermenter, it also adds a small potential for infection risk because obviously you've got all these little threads in here. You've got these little spouts, orifices and all that kind of stuff. So it is not a bad idea, I reckon, to just take the tap off. It takes two seconds to remove. Our particular flat bottom fermenters have no thread on the fermenter body itself. And then you can actually boil these components here. You can't boil the whole fermenter. This is not good because the PET basically can't handle over 45 degrees Celsius. But the tap certainly can be boiled you know and just on the stove top or whatever and that way you completely sanitize it you can just soak it in sanitizer as well it does the job but um, you know that is one thing I'll say which is worth doing because um, you know potentially your beer can go off if you've got like some bacteria or something like that growing in the tap so I've got my pot here which has come down to ambient temperature and uh, that's pretty much at a temperature now which I can pitch yeast into. This is sitting at about 20, 20 or 25 degrees, depending on how hot your ambient temperature is where you live, you know, you might have to wait a little bit longer uh, or not. Now I've also got this flat bottom fermenter. We've got so many different fermenters to choose from varying in price range, but obviously this video is to keep it as simple as possible. So I'm using the flat bottom and the flat bottom really, if you're bottling or something like that at home, it's kind of handy to have a tap of course, because then you can just go a hose or a bottling wand and go straight off the tap and use gravity. But if some of you guys want to just take uh, that extra step further, we've got some really great fermenters like the All Rounder and stuff like that. You actually carbonate the beer in the All Rounder and then you can drink carbonate 
carbonated beer directly out of that. So there's heaps of other really good options down the road if you sort of want to, you know, expand your uh, horizons in the hobby. So I'm going to take this lid off. I've already sanitized this. So I've mixed up some sanitizer here. This is basically the Stella San, really good value product we've got on our website. It's pretty much the most sold sanitizer in Australia now. And I'm actually thinking, how do I get this in here? Whether I use a funnel or whether I just wing it and I'm thinking I'm going to wing it. So um, this could really end up in a massive disaster. Now, everything about this situation now, I wanna keep as sanitary as possible. Try not to breathe in here, pour anything, spill anything in the top here, um, because I really wanna keep this really, really sanitary. I've also got a milk crate in here. Uh, normally I'd put this on the ground, but obviously that'll be out of the shot. So I'm trying to use it on the bench here. So I'm gonna stand on this milk crate and I'm gonna do my best to pour this in Look guys, probably you should use a funnel, honestly. I'm sort of looking at this going, oh my God, is this a good idea on camera? Um, okay, here we go. I'm just gonna give it a crack. Oh yeah, there we go. Now in this early stage of fermentation, you gotta remember that what we want is oxygen in there. So actually don't mind if we're pouring from a bit of a height because yeast needs oxygen to grow and in order for those yeast cells to populate and uh, basically grow in their population size, we really want a lot of oxygen in there. So yeast has two stages of growth. It has aerobic, which is the start where it's basically building up the population of yeast, and then it's got anaerobic fermentation. So after it runs out of nutrient and oxygen, basically no more yeast cells are able to populate, and then it basically caps off, and then um, essentially that's, that's as much yeast as you're gonna get. So I'm just gonna get some water, top this up to the 20 litre mark, and then we're gonna chuck in the yeast. Okay, so we top this up with water up to that 20 litre mark. I mean, you could even water it down to 23 litres if you want it, uh, you know, a little bit lower alcohol uh, beer. But I'm gonna go pretty much uh, to approximately 20 there. Um, yeah, so as I was saying, splashing is a good thing. Really want to get a lot of oxygen in there at this stage. It's even a good idea after you pitch the yeast to give the fermenter a good old shake -a because if you get a good shake, it's really going to get that, uh, that oxygen dissolved into the wort. Alrighty, so that's pretty much at the uh, 20 litre mark there. Now I'm, what I'm going to do is get this yeast and I'm going to tear the corner out. Look, sometimes not about, this can be a bit pedantic, I suppose, but look, I like to sanitize the pack as well, just to be making sure that, you know, not a stray bit of bacteria or something like that, or wild yeast is sort of dropping in the fermenter. Open that yeast pack up and then pour that in like so. And then get this lid and screw it on top. So yeah, because we did a boil before, I should also say whenever you boil wort or water or anything, basically that deoxygenates as well. So, you know, just to give us the best possible chance, gonna give this a really good shake. And any of that air in that headspace, hopefully, you know, that oxygen is gonna dissolve a little bit more into solution there like so. The other thing I'm gonna do is fill up this uh, little airlock. Now you could just use Stella Sand sanitizer, just a tiny bit of that in there. I'm gonna chuck in just some of this ethanol spray because on the bench here. Uh, look, some people just put straight water in here. Probably all right, I guess, but you know, the only problem with water is sometimes if that water gets a bit manky or something starts growing in it, especially if your temperature drops, you can sometimes suck some of the liquid in the airlock back into the fermenter. So, you know, I think sanitizer or ethanol is a slightly better option. Anyway, that's pretty much it. I'm gonna leave this to ferment. When we're done, um, we're gonna either bottle or can it a little bit later on. Okay, so about 10 days into the process and now it's time for us to dry hop the beer. Uh, look, some of the 15 minute boil kits will come with dry hops and some won't, just depends on the recipe. Obviously Pacific Ale is nice and fruity and we're expecting all of those hop aromas to come through. So we've got that sort of citrusy notes and stuff like that, uh, which we want to achieve. Um, and that's uh, obviously a good reason to be using some of these uh, New Zealand hops. So I'm gonna whip the lid open. Actually, one thing I'll notice is there's actually a fruit fly in the airlock here. So I'm really glad that I put sanitizer in here because if water was in there, that fruit fly probably would have introduced some type of bacteria to that water and possibly could have ended up in the fermenter. I'll also say that when I'm taking the lid off now, 
it's really, we wanna avoid oxidation at this stage. So early on in the fermentation, oxygen's good. As soon as that yeast starts to slow down, oxygen's bad. We do, don't do wanna get any excessive amounts of oxygen in here. So what we wanna do is have our bags ready to go. Um, what we can do is actually probably tear these open right now, actually come to think of it. So I'm gonna tear them open. I'm also gonna massage the hops a bit because we have a fairly hard vacuum on these. The hops don't pour out that freely, so I'm gonna do that. I'm also gonna go like this and just make sure they're ready to pour in there. So what I can do is pour it in and jam the lid back on as quickly as possible. So I'm basically gonna take this off um, and then I'm just gonna put that on the bench um, and really get those hops in as quickly as possible. Now, definitely it's also, you know, still important to be fairly sanitary, but now that there's, you know, alcohol present inside this beer, you know, there's a little bit less stress. It's most sensitive when you've got the start of the fermentation process and that yeast is just building up in population size. That's when your wort is most vulnerable to infection. Um, but now, you know, it's sort of slightly less so, even though you still wanna be careful about it. So um, now I'm gonna screw that lid on and just basically leave those hops in for a couple of days. Now hops are like any organic material in, you know, a bunch of liquid, I suppose. If you just leave hops in there for ages, you know, they're gonna eventually decompose and you get all these weird kind of flavors that will come out of there which aren't really ideal. Uh, but then also if I don't leave them in there long enough, then, you know, I'm gonna basically not extract all that, you know, great aroma and flavor out of the hops either, which I obviously wanna do. So, you know, generally in the vicinity of about one to two days, you're gonna basically max out everything and get out of the hops. So I would say, look, leave them in, for, in there for at least 24 hours, maybe two days, but definitely, you know, don't try to leave them in there much longer than that. The other thing I'll say about dry hopping is you generally want to do it at a, you know, at a time in the fermentation process where it's sort of either at high krausen, so when the yeast is really active, you know, that's sometimes a good time to throw them in because what happens is as the yeast is active, if you some oxygen does happen to get into the fermenter, it's gonna get basically sucked up by the yeast at that stage and it's aerobic, you know, part of that fermentation process. So that's gonna kind of help us and protect us from oxidizing, um, you know, the, uh, the, the beer itself. The other thing is um, you don't wanna leave it like, you know, really so late and crash out all the yeast either. If you end up chilling the fermenter, you know, it's really, you often won't get a lot of the biotransformation of the hops either if it's too cold. So, you know, look, the jury's not out in terms of like, you know, when is the optimal time to add hops. You ask 10 different people. Some people say high Krausen, some people say day seven, some people say, you know, at the end of the fermentation process. And it does depend a little bit on the beer style as well. So, but look, for the sake of this video, to try to keep it simple, I'm gonna say, look, somewhere between one week and two weeks, good time to dry hop round about then. Um, uh, definitely, yeah, dry hop before you chill is the ideal scenario. Um, all right, so that's uh, in there, and I'm gonna leave that for two days, come back after the weekend, and then we're gonna bottle this up, and uh, or we might even put some in a keg, see how I feel on the day. Anyway, that's it. Oh, also good to take a little sample. I've actually got a sample in here. The gravity reading's actually gone a little bit further. I probably would have preferred to dry hop slightly earlier than this when there's a little bit more yeast activity, but man, the, the Nottingham yeast is absolutely cranked through this, and it's already down at like uh, 10, you know, pretty much like 10.10, so 1.010 gravity, um, which is a little bit beyond what I was aiming for, but it, it, it's not that, you know, important. There's a little bit of like a leeway with these types of, uh, these types of things. And a bit of a taste as well. Now, obviously it's flat because it's a non-pressurizable fermenter, but look, it's starting to taste really good. It's like tasting like beer. And, you know, I can imagine when that's cold and carbonated, that's gonna be, uh, you know, pretty tasty. All right. I'll come back in a couple days and see how we go. Okay guys, we're now at one of the final stages of the process and we're gonna basically put this beer which is uncarbonated and put it into these bottles so they naturally carbonate. Um, now, the last couple of days where, since I added the hops, the hops firstly over the you know first day in, the hops are actually this big sort of solid cake at the top and what happens when you add hops, all of those bubbles from that fermentation process, it does kick off a little bit because some of the hops also contribute some extra sugars um, into the wort as well. So that'll sort of kick it off to another degree. But you'll notice that those bubbles, they kind of stick to the hops and form this crust. And that's the beauty about having a very clear fermenter as you can see what's going on. So I have actually given this a shake a couple of times, not like a huge shake, because I don't want to basically 
um, you know, get all this, you know, yeast which is settled out and get that all stirred up again, but enough of a shake that it basically shakes the bubbles off the hops and then the hops actually shake, uh, you know, settle down much more. So I did that uh, yesterday and then I also actually gave that a crack this morning and now it's like, um, you know, 1.30, 1.15 in the afternoon. And you can see those couple of shakes have actually caused the hops to form a bit of a dense layer at the bottom. They've kind of like, you know, got this sort of green layer above the yeast now where they've settled out, which is kind of what I'm after. Look, if you do get hops and they're sort of sitting up the top here, it's also not really a massive deal because you know, you're drawing liquid off from here. It just means that when you get towards the end, you might get one or two bottles with a you know, few little chewy bits in there. So anyway, I'm basically gonna fill these bottles up and um, go like this. So with the bottling wand like that, you basically wanna turn the tap on like this and then you wanna basically get this bottle and the tip of it is like pressure sensitive. So as you can say, when I push down on it, it basically activates. Now you could also get a blockage if you've got a chunk of hops. So if that does happen in the wand, you can basically remove the wand and wash it out in the sink. It, Cause this is a particular hoppy recipe that's, you know, there's a chance that that might happen. Um, the other thing you could do is also, if you get the bottle and just give it a few wax like that, that is sometimes enough just to push that hops through the a valve on the tip as well. So I'll just give you that little tip there. Um, now these bottles are 500 mil. We've got these PET plastic bottles. Look, the PET plastic bottles are pretty common these days, to be honest with you, um, because they, uh, you know, you eliminate that risk of them exploding. Uh, so once you've filled it up, look, drop in that carbonation drop in there like, like so, and then I'm just gonna whack on one of these lids. That's really, really easy. Um, another thing you could do is actually use the, um, uh, the glass bottles. We've got these glass swing tops. Look, these work pretty well. These also are in a 500 mil type. Uh, you've got to make sure you sanitize the bottle, of course. So I already sanitized them back house with the Stellasan sanitizer. Um, so I'm filling that up there, get another carbonation drop, drop that in there. Um, look, I'm not going to do the whole lot on camera because obviously it's pretty boring. Um, but what I will say is, um, yeah, it's also important to double check the gravity as well. Make sure you absolutely have stopped moving. If it is still fermenting, you want to just leave it a little bit longer because the last thing you want to do is have, look, your beer, you know, with too much sugars in it. And then once you bottle, it's basically going to have too much sugars, too much carbonation, and then it can essentially make the bottle explode. Now, another thing I've also done is I put some of the beer into basically out of here. I just filled up one of these two and a half liter bottles. So you can actually also, you know, prime in one of these. Um, now I actually stuck this in the fridge so the bottle shrank and it's kind of like sucked in a little bit there like that. But I'm gonna basically carbonate this with a gas cylinder and the carbonation cap. So I've got a gas cylinder here. Look, I know this is supposed to be like a low tech video, but you know, we do sell a lot of things like gas cylinders and carbonation equipment and stuff like that. So just to make a little bit of a sample, I'm gonna get this uncarbonated beer and literally shake this for, honestly, just a few shakes like that, it's probably enough. And now, because I had this sitting in the fridge for a few hours, um, this should already be carbonated and then we can get a bit of a sample and taste what this is like and kind of shortcut the process because normally, you know, as I've just put the priming sugars in there, I'm gonna have to wait probably, you know, two, three weeks for that to carbonate, but I can kind of shortcut this process and just drink it straight away by doing this, so. There we go. All right, so the color's looking pretty good. It's as you would expect kind of for, for a Pacific Ale. Um, you know, generally if I did this in all grain recipe, I probably would get the color even slightly lighter if I used all grain, but. And it is, it is a legitimately tasty beer. Now, look, I have not done a lot of extract beers recently, but getting back into it, I totally can say that it's an easy, easy way. This type of recipe, it's a 15 minute boil. Um, you know, you don't need a lot of equipment and you can still make, you know, clearly a uh, fantastic beer, uh, you know, using this method and using mostly extract and like a pot you got at home. Uh, I will also say, look, if you guys did want to sort of progress from this type of setup, there's lots of different ways you can upgrade this type of kit. You could get a pressurizable fermenter, as I was saying before. What I could do is get a gas cylinder, carbonate the beer in the fermenter. And obviously if I have the ability to chill the whole fermenter down, 
I can then transfer carbonated beer from the fermented direct to bottle and then just not have to worry about this secondary fermentation process. Another thing is really handy. It's actually transferring these little uh, PCO four liter or eight liter kegs. These are really inexpensive. Another great way for you to get into homebrew kegging because you can actually just go straight off here, fill up into these kegs and then carbonate with a gas cylinder in a big keg like that. And then you can take them off to parties or stick them in your fridge at home. So another good option there. But anyway, look, that is pretty much the whole, you know, 15 minute boil kit process. We're gonna do a few other videos coming up on different recipes on the 15 minute boil kits we got up on the website. So keep an eye out for those. Um, you know, I know that there's like a, another porter recipe and a few other ales. We've got an Aussie draft as well. Uh, I think that just went up there recently. So um, yeah, we're gonna cover a few of those. Might even get uh, Richard from Lullamond. He's a real expert. Um, he might come in and also do some uh, recipes and uh, brew days doing 15 minute boil kits as well. So anyway, that is it. Getting back to basics with uh, home brewing on extract kits. If you wanna hear about anything else, definitely bottom right hand corner, hit subscribe now. And make sure to hit that bell so you get notified when we bring out a new video. The other thing you can do is join our homebrew community group. Lots of other guys sharing tips and tricks on how to get the most out of the gear. So just jump on Facebook, search Kegland Homebrew Community Group, and you know there's many, many thousands of people there already um, you know, in the conversation. All right, thanks for that, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye.